Slices, maps and channels. You probably use them at work every day. But do you know how they work underneath? Well, Jesus is going to tell us everything about it. Hi, I'm Jesus and I'm going to talk about where I live. I live in Guadalajara, a small city near Madrid. It's a very interesting place because have a lot of history and have a, a, a lot of very interesting buildings, very gorgeous buildings. For example, here we have see we can see the Palacio de Infantado, that is a, is the most famous building here in the city. This uh, architecture from the outside is is really iconic here. Uh, in the inside, we can see some architecture with a lot of influ influence from the Muslims. Uh, we can see, for example, also um, the cathedral of the city. Also, we have a lot of uh, green zones, uh, a lot of gardens and, and parks, but uh, there is a mixture between history and gardens that is really interesting. You can walk around these gardens and, and see interesting buildings, uh, a lot of history mixed with, uh, with a park, so it's, it's really, really cool. Also, the region is really gorgeous. This, for example, is uh, one of the, what is called the Black Towns that are at the north of the region. These Black Towns are, are really, really popular and everything is, is done with black stones, uh, so it's, it's really, really nice to see. Also, something that is, is really popular here in my region during the spring is the lavender uh, fields, where you can go there and see all the field of lavender and this is really gorgeous. Also, we have a lot of places to, to do hiking and all that stuff. You can see waterfalls, you can see a lot of, uh, a lot of, well, yeah, we, can, we can go to forests uh, and, and all that stuff. It's, it's really cool. Also, we have in the region a lot of history. For example, here we have a, a castle that has more than a millennium. So that's it. If you want to visit my region, you're welcome. Hi, everybody. My name is Jesus Espino, I'm software engineer at Maramos, and today I'm going to talk about dissecting channels, the slices, and maps in Go. Well, for this, uh, we are going to need some class materials, an Escopel, a microscope, and the subject. Let's see what it means for Go. Slices. In slices, what we are going to use as an Escopel is going to use unsafe to read the the data that is stored in memory in runtime and, and store that data in a structure. With that data, we are going to explore that with our microscope, that is this function. We are going to see what is uh, stored in the runtime uh, and see how it evolves during the usage of the slice. And the subject, in this case, we are going to see how what is a slice that is basically an array and some, well, maybe one or more slices. Let's see how it looks like inside uh, a slice. A slice is just a, a pointer to an array, uh, a length, that is uh, the length of the, of the slice and the capacity of the slice. That is the length of the array. The array is, uh, is going to have a type, but that type is going to be the type of the slice. In this case, we are going to use integer as an example because it's, it's simpler. And, and yeah, let's see how it, how it looks like. If I create an empty list, an empty slice, I'm going to get a memory address that is not real, it's just, uh, well, it's not pointing to any, anything meaningful. The length of the slice is zero, the capacity of the slice is zero, and the stored data is just nothing because there's nothing to store yet. If I append something to this slice, 
now I have a, a real memory address that is pointing to this uh, to one array. In this case, we see that the slice capacity is one, so it's an array of one position of, of one integer in memory. And the, and the length of the slice is one. So we have one capacity, one length, and the data is just the number one in this case. If I store more data, in this case, I'm just appending two, three, four, five. During that process, the array is going to grow because the size of the array is not being, going to be enough. So the go, the go interpreter, the go runtime is going to create a new, uh, a new array memory. It's going to reserve some memory and it's going to keep growing that array. It's going to reserving bigger and bigger array and migrating the data over time when the when the array grows. In this case, it's, it's not adding one or something like that. It's growing more than uh, what is strictly needed to avoid regrowing too much. So in this case, we added five. Uh, we added four more values. So the slice length now is five, five, but the underneath array have a capacity of eight. So the stored data in memory, the real stored data in memory is one, two, three, four, five, zero, zero, zero. All that memory is already reserved and is the data is there. If I get a sub slice from there, this is where it gets interesting. If I get a sub slice from position one to position four, of this original slice, we are going to see that the memory address is not exactly the same, but it's pretty similar. So let's see, the, or, the, the original uh, slice was C000018540. And now we can see that it's C000018548. That eight at the end is the difference that is eight bytes more that is the size of one integer in my in my current CPU architecture. So that is eight bytes. So it's a bit more. It's it's just the same array but in a different position. The slice length is three, and the slice capacity is seven. The array capacity is eight, but because we are starting from the position one in this super slice, I don't have the whole capacity of the array. So I only have seven positions to store data. In this case, we can see that the, the, the data storing that array from the perspective of this slice is two, three, four, five, zero, zero, zero. And more, even more interesting is if I modify this, that sub slice in the position zero, because we are using the same underneath array, we are modifying my sub slice and the other slice because we are sharing the same array. So if I explore the both um, arrays, I can see here that the, the original array now is 10345000, and I haven't modified that. I have modified the slice. That can sound acceptable if you understand that slices are windows to other slices. Sounds like sensible, sounds okay. Okay, let's see if this sounds acceptable or not. If you append something to the super slice, it's going to append that to the super slice. So the super slice is going to have now four elements and the fourth element of the slice is going to be six. Sounds, sounds okay. But the original slice get modified too. And the, fi the five elements, the fifth element of the original slice gets overridden by this uh, by this append of the super slice, what is weird, but well, you can understand that they are using the same array under the hood, makes sense. But more interesting, even more interesting, imagine that I have a, a, um, this uh, slice and I add more elements to that, so the slice grows, and the underneath array change, 
And now, suddenly, that two arrays are disconnected. So now I can change the sub slice, and I'm not affecting the underneath the slice, the, the, the original slice, because no longer is they are no longer sharing the same array. So it's it's tricky. I will suggest to not try to leverage that window behavior if you don't know what's going on, because if suddenly something um, trigger our size in the slice is not going to be um, having this window effect. So yeah, be careful with the super slices. That's it. This is the code. If you want to see the code uh, or you want to copy the code, uh, I'm going to uh, put a link to my GitHub repo with all this code at the end of the um, of the slides uh, of the slides. So yeah. That's the code. If you want to play with this, investigate. Okay, let's talk about maps. Well, for the maps, we have the SCALPL. It's going to read the memory in runtime, all that stuff, it's store, it's store down in the struct. Then I'm going to use my micro microscope to print that struct information. And then I have the subject. In this case, it's, it's the map that is just the map metadata and a set of buckets that are storing the data. This is the map structure. We have count, that is the number of elements that, is a, that are stored in the, in the map. We have flags, it's not very important now. We are not going to talk about that. The B, uh, the B value is uh, going to give you an information about how many buckets are uh, currently in the map. It's not exactly the number of buckets, it's, it's something like the number of growths of something like that, but well, is not exactly the number of buckets. Um, the number of overflows is um, is an approximation of the number of overflows that are in the in the map now. The hash zero is a uh, is a random number that is used to generate the the hashes for the keys. Then we have the buckets that is a pointer to a set of buckets that we are going to see later what is, what a bucket is. And the old buckets is another pointer to another set of buckets. And evacuate is the number of evacuated buckets. And then we have some extra data, uh, some pointers to overflow buckets and things like that. Okay, the bucket struct uh, is, is a, it's a struct that is going to store the, the data. In this case, we are using integers. For the for the keys and the values, so that's the reason the key and values are uh, arrays are integers arrays. Each uh, each bucket is going to have um, a top hash, the keys that is an array of eight positions, and values that is an array of eight positions. Each position corresponds to the same key value pair. And then an overflow pointer. The overflow pointer is a pointer to another bucket that is used when this bucket gets full and needs to overflow that. That is something that not necessarily have to happen always. So we are going to see uh, when when this happens. The top hash is interesting because the top hash is going to store the is going to store the top the top part of each hash of each key that is stored in the bucket. And it's going to basically have this chunk of, of data and it's going to concatenate all that data in a uh, uint 64. But it's, each, each, each chunk of data is going to refer to one position in the keys. Uh, and we see that, well, and that is, is just for certain optimization. If you search for the hash, you just check if, if that hash matches in the top hash, and if that hash matches something in the top hash, it's because the key is there. And then you can go to the key, get the hash of the key, and verify that the key is really the key that you are looking for. Okay, let's see what happens if I create a map. If I create an empty map, everything is going to be more or less zero because it's an empty map, so the size is zero, the flux is zero, the B is zero. Uh, the B0 means that you have only one bucket. Uh, the number of overflow buckets is zero. The hash sheet is going to be 
uh, random number. That random number is not going to change ever uh, in the in the map itself uh, because if that number change, it's no longer possible to access to the to the keys. The buckets are going to, uh, well, and then I have the pointer to the buckets. I can see the pointer to the buckets. That is a bucket that is empty with top hash zero, all the keys zero, all the values zero, all the workflow pointer zero. And then we have the old buckets that is a pointer that is, is nil for now. And the number of evacuated buckets is zero. So let's see what happens if I insert one, um, one value. I'm going to insert the value 10 in the key one. Uh, so now the map size is one. Uh, everything else is, is the same except for the bucket. The top hash is going to, uh, well, it's going to generate the key one using a hash function that is defined by Go. That hash function is going to take the seed and take the key and, and generate the hash. And it's going to store just a chunk of the hash in the top hash. That way, he can check that before and, and don't need to recalculate the hash of the key to verify if the key is exactly what you spell. Uh, well, not recalculate the key. He's not going to need to, uh, to check uh, if the key, if, if, he's not going to need to check every single key and all that stuff. So he's going to go to the top hash, he's going to, uh, to check that and it's going to go to the key and it's going to get the value. The interesting part of the hash sheet is every map have a different uh, hash sheet that is random, so you can't uh, you can't know what is the what is the order of the keys or where or in which buckets are the keys and all that stuff. So that's the reason why you don't uh, you are not able to. Uh, to relay on the sort uh, on the order of a map in Go. Okay, if you go to the if you insert more data, for example, in this case we have eight more elements. Now the the map size is nine. The B is one because there the, uh, there was a resize. The resize. Um, generates a new, uh, reserve a new chunk of memory to store two blocks and migrated all the data from the, the previous existing block to the new blocks. So we see here that now the, the keys are distributed between both, between the bucket zero and the bucket one. The top hash is generated based on that and all that stuff. And we can see that the number of evacuated buckets is one because we had to migrate one bucket from the old version to the new version, to a new set of packets. So uh, we now have uh, we now have one evacuated packets. If I add more data, in this case, I'm going to explain what is an overflow. If I add more data, then you, you can reach the point where, for certain uh, bad luck or whatever, you end up filling a bucket, but the rest of the map is not cool enough to justify uh, a resize. So for that cases, what it's going to do is just, if the bucket is full, it's going to create another bucket and add, uh, add that bucket to the overflow pointer. And that overflow pointer is going to just point to this new bucket and you are going to store the new data, the extra data that is not, uh, that you are not able to store in the original bucket in this new overflow bucket. That is not going to generate any evacuated buckets or something like that, or change the B or something like that, because it's not uh, a resize. Uh, but the number of overflow buckets is going to be one this uh, now, because there's one overflow bucket. What happens when there's a big resize? When there's a big resize of, uh, of a map, you will have tons of, uh, of buckets, imagine 128 buckets. And suddenly you have to resize that and you don't want to just stop everything and start growing the star. Well, probably, probably 125 buckets is even small, but you can imagine huge map, uh, thousands of buckets, and suddenly you need to resize your map. 
you don't want to stop everything, reset the new memory, and migrate over all the data, because that is going to take time. And maybe it's just some milliseconds, or maybe even more if the if the resize is huge. But what? Uh, but that can be really annoying. So what? Go does is just create this, reserve this new chunk of memory for for a, a bigger set of packets, and over time, uh, start migrating the old packets to the new packets. It's going to point the buckets uh, pointer is going to point to this new memory. The old buckets is going to point to the old memory, and when you do operations, for example, you set a, a new key or something like that is going to take advantage of that action to just migrate some data, migrate some buckets to the new buckets. And, and eventually all the buckets are migrated to the new, uh, to the new buckets. While you have these two uh, old buckets and new buckets structures, you will have to do more reads, you, are, you will be um, using more memory and all that stuff, but is the, is the trade-off uh, to not need to stop everything and migrate everything over uh, just in, uh, directly, so you can do you can defer that and do it over time. Okay, this is the code. If you want to explore, just take the code and and play with it. Channels. Let's talk about channels. Um, well, the same approach. I'm going to read what's going on in the runtime memory. Let's store that in a structure. I'm going to print that structure of the information. And the subject is a channel. I have inputs, I have outputs, some internals. Let's see. This is a, this is a ch how ch a channel looks like inside. Um, this is a buffer channel. I'm talking about buffer channels because they are more interesting. Because if you remove all the buffered channels, uh, all the buffered part, that is just this block in the middle, all this queue count, that data queue size, element size, buffer, receive X and X, all that is just for the buffer. If you remove that, you end up having just a channel. So I'm going to talk about buffered channels, uh, and you can uh, imagine how the, ch the channels without buffer should work. In this case, we have the queue count, that is the number, the number of elements in the queue, the data queue size, that is the number of, uh, the number of elements that uh, the queue can store, the buffer, that is an array of elements. Uh, in this case, we are going to use an integer 32 um, type, a channel type, and we are going to use a buffer size of four. So the buffer is an array of four positions with integer uh, 32. The element size is the size that is going to uh, take the each element in the in the queue. The, the closet is uh, a plug to, to define if the channel is open or closed. The element type is just um, is the is a pointer to the element that is going to be a store in the channel. The send x and the receive x are two uh, to indexes, to values that points to the position in the buffer that is the next one that is going to be writing or written uh, for the channel. The receive queue and the send queue are two wait queues that are basically a, a list of um, a little go routines that are waiting for something. In this case, are waiting for receiving, are waiting for sending uh, data to the channel. Okay, let's see how it looks like when you create an empty channel. I'm creating an empty channel of type in 32 uh, with four positions, with four uh, with a buffer of size four. We can see here that the queue count is zero, the data queue size is four. The element size is four because we are using an integer 32, so that is four bytes. The element type is a pointer that is, doesn't matter here. And the buffer is this just this array of uh, in memory. 
that have a, and the sen x and receive x are the two pointers that are pointing here to the first position. Well, they are two integers that are just indexes to you to, to say what position is uh, the next send uh, position and the next receive position in the buffer. The buffer now is uh, all zeros because we don't have anything in the buffer. Uh, of course, not closed, and the send and the receive queues are empty. If I inject one uh, value in the channel, in this case five, I'm going to see that uh, the Q count is one now. The position, the first position of the buffer is going to be five because it was the position where the sen x was before. Um, and that's it. If I inject more data, if I uh, add more data to the channel, in this case, I add four, three, two, one. Uh, I'm going to see uh, that sen x was here. So I now have four, three, two, but now the Qcon is, is four, so the the um, buffer is, is full. So the the go routine that is trying to set the one is going to say, okay, I can't insert the one because the, the channel is full. So I'm going to add myself to the weight queue and I'm going to pause myself and let the uh, let the the go runtime to do, uh, to schedule another another go routine. So then somebody come here and start reading from that channel, and it's going to read the five element and uh, the five value from here because the receive x is here, and it's going to wake the wake up the the go routine and the go routine is going to insert the value one. So I get the five from here and I insert the one here. If I read more, I'm going to get the four because the receive X is here. So I'm going to read the four here and I'm going to decrease the Qcon because it's no longer, it's no longer four, it's now three. If I read more, I'm going to read three, two, one, that is here, three, two, one. And the current Q count is zero because it's going to everything is 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 already written, uh, but the, then another go routine it wants to read something from from the channel, so the channel is empty, so it's it's going to park himself in the in the wait queue in the receive wait queue. It's going to go there. It's going to insert himself and it's going to uh, pause himself and let the run the go run time to take another uh, go routine. If I close the channel, that go routine that was waiting is going to receive this closed message and uh, the closed flag is going to set to one and everything is going to be, uh, well, it's expected. The channel is no longer usable and all that stuff. This is the code if you want to see it. Here are some references. Uh, in the Go code, you have the runtime, uh, the runtime, in, uh, the runtime directory, and there you have a slice map and chan that is going to have all this structure and it's going to have a lot of information about how uh, how it really works internally slices, maps, and, and channels. And if you want to see my code and you want to uh, play with it, you can see my uh, Go rep my dissecting Go repo in GitHub. And that's it. Thank you, everybody.